in 2009, there were 13 million Americans living with cancer. Now, I could give you the numbers, but put it this way. You will all know someone with cancer and maybe lose them in your lifetime. Now, I have known maybe 100 people with cancer, and I'm not a doctor, I'm a writer, and I launch tech companies. I know 10 people who are fighting cancer right now, and really, by virtue of being in the same room with me, you should probably go get any body part you're worried about screened. <laughs> <laughs> now, cancer is not a gift, not, but I have learned that it does bring gifts, gifts that can be transformative, gifts that reveal ourselves to ourselves. And it doesn't actually have to be cancer. It can be any disease or anything, really, that reminds us that we're going to die. When we let go of our fear of cancer, we open ourselves to those gifts, because the reverse is also true. By letting go of our fear of cancer, we also understand what, it's mean, what it means to be alive. So let me tell you how this started. When I was in my 20s and absolutely caught up with myself and my own life, a dear family friend had cancer. And I kept coming up with very important things to do, reasons to not go see him. And in your 20s, you have so much time. But suddenly, he was gone. His wife forgave me. She loved me. But I was filled with shame and remorse, and I had no way to make it better. So I swore the next time would be different. What I didn't know was that the next time would be soon. Within a few years, one of my best friends, and then my mother, and then another friend, and then another, and another, were diagnosed with cancer. And it was different. I cherished them. I adopted the stance that we call in Nia, this dance martial arts thing I do, ready, alert, waiting. I figured that if they were brave enough to go through it, I could be brave enough to face whatever they were facing with them. I did my best to be there for them because this time I understood that I might not get another chance. Some of it was practical, you know, laundry, meals, carpool. Some of it was just being good company to talk about it, not talk about it. And then, as long as they believed they were getting, gonna get better, I believed right along with them. And some of them did. But if they got tired of fighting, and if they told me I needed to let them go, I had to be ready for that too. So even though I had days where it felt like I was walking through sand and moments where it hurt to look up at the sky and see that it was beautiful, when I felt so shattered, I found the peace to let them go because that was what they asked for and that was what was needed. So what are the gifts? Well, immediacy, perspective, priorities, no regrets, grace, and time, especially time. If you have ever lost someone suddenly, you've heard them say, if only I'd had the chance to, well, cancer sucks, but it gives you that chance. It may break your heart every day, but it gives you that chance. Now, I want to talk about a friend of mine who has pancreatic cancer. In our society today, we think we know what cancer does in the body. We think we know statistically about types and stages of cancer, and that pancreatic cancer is a death sentence. Well, here she is. She looks great, right? Yeah. And you know what? She's not dead. She's very much alive. And she's awesome. And what she has said since I asked her, what she'd like me to tell people is that she just wants people to be brave, show compassion, say something as simple as, I'm sorry you're going through this. What do you need? So here's the first thing. 
When you hear someone has cancer, remember to not know, because you don't. Stages are great for doctors, but I've known people who were supposed to live who didn't, and people who weren't supposed to be here who are. We want to know, we want answers, so that we can avoid whatever this person did. You know, did they smoke? Did they eat the wrong things? We want to try and control, and you know, that's natural, because it's scary, but control is kind of an illusion after a certain point. So the best thing you can do is not know. When you don't know, you leave room for hope. You're just ready, alert, and waiting. You're with them in that moment to do whatever it is they need. And that's a gift. My friend Dale, when she was about three years out from her diagnosis, she said, you know, I almost missed the days right after I got, found out I had breast cancer, because everything was so precious. Everything is so precious. It sounds hokey, but cancer reminds us to not take, to take things for granted, to look up and realize, oh my god, the sun breaking over the flat irons. How long has it been since I realized how gorgeous they are? Or the way a child's neck smells like chlorine and sun after a day at the pool, or that special smile a friend gives us when we make a weak pun. Oh, well, I make a weak pun. Or how our pets snuggle us. Cancer also has a way of revealing ourselves to ourselves. Those deals you make in the middle of the night, you know, just let me live and I swear I'll be a better father. Please, God, let my mother live and I'll quit working so much. Let my partner live and I'll call my mother. <laughs> I'll go to church, I'll go to temple, whatever it is. It's something you know you need to do. So you might as well do it now and save yourself the anxiety. If you catch yourself saying, I'll make you a deal, listen to it. You're telling you, and that's a gift. Which reminds me, the gift of no regrets goes something like this. When you know someone who has cancer, or if you have cancer, just apply this simple rule. What will I be able to live with or die with if things don't go well? Now, so if you're thinking about someone who has cancer and you're not sure what to say and you're not sure if you should call, make that damn call. <laughs> you know, if they live, they'll remember. If they don't live, you'll remember and you'll be at peace. And if you can't face it, well, you know, that's okay. If you can live with it, I mean, then that tells you something. But I found it to be an amazingly simple rule. Now, I happen to have lupus, and I've also almost lost my, each of my children in close calls. And I've lost more than my fair share of people. So I have a healthy impatience for bullshit. Cancer will do that too. Cancer will tell you, this over here, here, <laughs> is big. This over here, the office politics, the, the stupid thing my brother said that I can't get over, that little project that I've been worrying about, like a little hamster on a wheel, that is small. It's forced perspective. It's instant priorities. And it works for almost every decision you'll ever make. Everyone, I swear. You don't have to have cancer. My friend Donna, when she was diagnosed, she brilliantly compared it to 9-11. She said, you didn't even know you were being attacked. And then afterwards, nothing's ever the same. To be diagnosed with cancer is to suddenly jump off of your old life onto a conveyor belt of treatments and appointments and choices, and that's if you're lucky enough to have health insurance. If you love someone who has that diagnosis, then you feel helpless, and you want to do something, or 
you hide because, you know, somehow cancer might be contagious. But usually you want to do something. And sometimes you rush in, and you rush in before they're even ready. And so I would say again, ask what is needed, because that is grace. Realizing that it is not about what you need to feel less helpless. It's not about what you need to feel less afraid. My friend Jacob <laughs> wanted to keep cooking for his wife, even though he had zillions of friends offering to make meals for them because he felt it was a way for him to nurture her amidst all the chaos. My friend Kara was upset when her husband wanted to do the laundry because she felt like he was preparing for her to die and she wasn't ready. But later, when Kara lay dying, I promised her I'd keep an eye on her sons. Her husband was coping, and he was learning to cook and do the laundry after all. And the one thing he couldn't cope with, though, was talking to her son's schools, telling them everything that had happened and asking for extra time for them to take tests and turn in work. I could do that. I did do that, because what he was doing was big, and what I did was small. But the gift of grace goes both ways. I would have done anything to save those boys from not losing their mother, and I couldn't. But him allowing me to help was actually a gift he gave me too, which leads me back to the first and last gift. Oh, I have a strong thumb. time, including the time to say goodbye. You know, by the time my mother was in hospice, I had come to the conclusion that it was silly to celebrate someone's life when they were no longer there to hear it. So we threw her a goodbye party, which was shocking at the time, <laughs> but it changed everything. She had been a big civil rights activist, and the mayor and the governor and the state legislature issued a proclamation naming it B. Branscombe Day. And she probably weighed less than 100 pounds. She was in a wheelchair. She was in pain. But like 300 people came, and they told her they loved her, told her what she'd meant to them, told her goodbye. And she was radiant. And a few people didn't like it, but mostly we heard, thank you. I had no idea she was going so fast. You gave me a chance I didn't even know I needed. She asked to remarry my dad in hospice, too. And <laughs> how could we say no? We didn't even ask my dad. <laughs> we just got a cake and a veil and an officiant and invited a few people. And he said, I started this marrying her. I'll end it marrying her. They renewed their vows in a little room in the hospice with the afternoon sun streaming in through the windows. And when they got to the part where they said, do you take this woman in sickness and in health till death do you part? Everybody was sobbing. All except my mother and my father. Because love makes you brave. So if cancer or something similar comes into your life, let it remind you of your life, because the fear of death will be there anyway. In fact, you don't even need cancer. Just appreciate your gift of time every day. Sort out what's big from what isn't. Focus on what you can control. Remember to look up. And make the damn call. Put it this way. I'll make you a deal. <laughs>